1966 saw a major turning point in rock and popular music that saw the importance of the hit single shift to album-oriented rock. And at the forefront of this change was the band Cream. We're going to track their brief but significant lifespan here on Pop Goes the 60s. To get the full story of Cream, we have to start with the Graham Bond organization. Now, I've done a full video on Graham Bond and his band that uh, Bruce and Baker came from. And the last we heard, Ginger Baker fired Jack Bruce at knife point, <laughs> literally. So these guys did not get along. They just had a major personality clash. So once Baker left Graham Bond, he met up with Eric Clapton. Now, Clapton had been bouncing around a little bit, but it was mainly with John Mayall's Blues Breakers. And they were at loose ends and Clapton wanted to form a band, as did Baker. But Clapton said, hey, I really would love to have Jack Bruce in the band and, and do a trio, not, not knowing that they had this history together. Now, Clapton had played with Bruce in John Mayall's band briefly, so he knew he was a great player. Clapton had also sat in with the Grand Bond organization on at least one occasion. So Ginger Baker, even though these guys had just major personality clashes, uh, that's Bruce and Baker I'm talking about. They understood that each player was an excellent musician and they respected their playing. And that really won out and that's what made them get back together. If you took away anything from my Graham Bond video it was that that band was the breeding ground for the virtuoso player if you were a bass player, drummer, or keyboardist. But really the guitar virtuosos came from John Mayall's Blues Breakers. John Mayall had been on the scene for quite a while and just released an album in early 65 that was a live album. And that was about the time Eric Clapton left the Yardbirds. Of the three guys that started Cream, Clapton had the highest profile because of his time in the Yardbirds initially. And he left because they, they went in a pop direction. They did the song For Your Love, and he was more of a blues purist. So he didn't really like that direction. That's why he left. So he hooked up with John Mayall. And he was with Mayall for a few months uh, before he got itchy feet and started another band and went off to Greece. And that band was called The Glands. And that band failed miserably. And he came back, and he had an open invitation to come back to Mayall. And it was at this time, in later 65, when he started working on the album that became Blues Breakers with Eric Clapton. <laughs> The famous graffiti that Clapton is God was sprayed in late 65, early 66 in London. This is where he was really gaining a lot of a fine reputation in the clubs for his playing. Song I'm Your Witch Doctor was a single that was released by John Mayall. And Clapton also did some outside projects. He also worked with Jack Bruce in The Powerhouse, and that's with Steve Winwood and Paul Jones from Man for Man. Now, this is the famous Eric Clapton album with John Mayall called Blues Breakers. This is Mayall's second album, and this is what really made Clapton a pretty big underground star. He just started to get above ground when this album came out. But by that time, he had already left the band and started a band with Baker and Bruce. Now, Baker and Bruce, as I said earlier, they had put their differences aside. They wanted to ex expand their playing quite a bit, and they wanted to you know, stretch out. And they had a, a very good feeling of where music was going. And obviously, they, they had a great blues background and adding Clapton. They were just ex excited the moment they played together, and it's, it just felt right. Now, when they got together, there was really no big expectation that, that they were going to become these huge stars, but really they thought they would be playing the same circuit that Graham Bond and Mayall was playing, and that's exactly where they started. <laughs> Now, these guys were well aware that they were probably the three most exciting players on the British scene, except for maybe Jeff Beck. 
and they named themselves the cream for being the cream of the crop. And the term, the band's name was eventually shortened to just cream, but the, the article the was used pretty much throughout their entire existence. So Ginger Baker was the elder member of the band and he had a, a great reputation on the scene. He brought a very heavy sound to his drum playing and these African rhythms he had been experimenting with since his early days learning from Phil Seaman, he really incorporated that into cream sound. Now Jack Bruce was considered the best harpist in Cyril Davies and his bass playing, his jazz undertones just made him one of the best bass players on the scene and is inventive, if not more so than McCartney. He also used a six-string bass, which came in pretty handy in expanding the sound when they were only playing in a trio. Now, Bruce was also going to be the lead vocalist. He had quite a lot of experience with Graham Bond's band, though he was never the featured vocalist in the band, unfortunately, but he had a very strong voice. That leaves Eric Clapton on lead guitar and vocals. He didn't sing as much as Bruce. He didn't have as strong of a voice, but he was starting to sing more. And a few did more than Eric Clapton to take the British blues movement to new heights becoming the prototypical guitar hero. There's a now, after several successful club dates, they became the, the talk of London. And this was late 1966, about you know August, September. And you can imagine the buzz at that time. Swing in London was really swinging. And the club scene was looking for new bands like this. This was a new sound. And the blues and the jazz and all that kind of uh, R&B mod stuff was quickly going to change into the psychedelic scene. And at the forefront of that movement was Cream. Wrapping paper in the gutter, moving slowly as the wind on the sea. Wrapping Paper was an unlikely single for them. It didn't really sound anything like them live. And I'm not sure how they came to that song, other than the idea was to bring Pete Brown in. He was a poet, and he was going to help them on lyrics because they weren't, they weren't prolific writers. And Brown was really brought in to write with Ginger Baker. Now, Ginger Baker really was a, not only was a fine musician, but he was a legit band leader. He could arrange songs, so he had quite a, a wide range of talents, and he could compose. And Pete Brown ended up writing more with Jack Bruce. One of the problems on this very first single is Ginger Baker thought that the whole band wrote the song, but the credits to, on the song was only credited to Bruce and Pete Brown. And that became a contentious, uh, that became a bone of contention with Baker as to who actually is writing the song. So there was trouble right off the bat between Bruce and Baker. Cat Squirrel was the B side of the first single and sounded exactly like they sounded live. So the, the, the fans who were alienated by wrapping paper were reassured by Cat Squirrel. Reaction Records was owned by Robert Stigwood and he became their manager. And really without Stigwood's backing, this band never would have got off the ground. So after the misstep with wrapping paper, they quickly recorded their follow up single. As important as Stigwood was to the band, he was not invited to this uh, recording session of I Feel Free. He must have been unwelcome because at one point they had forced him into one of Ginger Baker's drum cases and they rolled him down the stairs. Now, I Feel Free got to number 11 in the charts, which was really good. It was a legitimate hit, so they were able to start recording their first album. Put this boots full of diamonds. So the band got right down to business with a heavy dose of blues with Spoonful, which became one of their signature songs. And from four until eight was an Eric Clapton lead vocal. Now Jack Bruce was probably writing more than the others at this point, and he was still still developing. And he came up with this song, Dreaming. The ballad Dreaming added some diversity, but they really stuck pretty close to the blues for most of this album. Now this is the album here. This is the British version. I've got two albums here because 
It was released in two different covers, slightly different covers. So you can see this is the American version with a different logo on it. This is the Atco version. And there's a different track listing. So you've got the backs are a little different as well. And the singles in America were put on the album. So I Feel Free was on the American album. I'm so glad, I'm so glad, I'm glad. The song Toad contained one of the first extended drum solos probably in rock, and it was very much imitated, but Ginger Baker was the first to do that. The band had a minor hit in the States with I Feel Free. It bubbled under, and it wasn't a big hit, but a big enough hit to get them to go to the States, book some dates, do some live shows, and also record their follow-up album. Now, Stigwood really did some fancy footwork in America, getting them signed to Atlantic, and Ahmet Ergen was really liked the group. This became uh, the focus of the recording. They were going to record mostly in America and at the Atlantic Studios in New York. And Erdogan, uh, he liked the blues direction they had gone with their first album. And some of the music they came, were coming up with now in early 67, you had the whole psychedelic scene going on and the songs they were writing now were not as bluesy. And Erdogan didn't like that. And he actually wanted Eric Clapton to be the lead singer. And they were going to put him out front as the lead guitarist, lead singer, and have the other two guys in the back. And the band said, no way. Clapton really wasn't a strong enough singer to do that. And he didn't have the material uh, to really sing at that point anyway. So that was discussed very up front. The other thing is that when they were signed to Atlantic, uh, one of the reasons Cream got signed was... The Bee Gees were part of the deal. Stigwood also represented the Bee Gees, and it, Atlantic really wanted the Bee Gees, and Cream was kind of like a, a, a rider to get, to get the Bee Gees signed. So they were kind of a throw-in. Originally, Tom Dow was brought in to produce the second album, but he, like Erdogan, he, he called this their, their new song Psychedelic Hogwash. So somehow, Felix Popolardi came into the scene as a potential producer. Now, Felix Popolardi came out of the Greenwich Village folk scene originally, and then he started producing people like the Youngbloods and Joan Baez, and he was working at Atlantic. Now, he loved what Cream was doing, and he actually lobbied for the work not to be too blues, and then he got the producer's job. Not only did Popolardi help them create a better sound at Atlantic Studios, they really fine-tuned their sound, he also began to write. So there was a song they had worked on called Lottie Mama. It was more of a blues song with a really great groove. And he took that song with his wife, they rewrote lyrics, and it, that became Strange Brew. Strange Brew, killing what's inside of you. Success came quickly as Cream's material fit in perfectly with the burgeoning rock scene, but occasionally they would make a sidestep with this beer commercial. Falstaff, the clear beer from St. Louis, brings you Cream from London. It wasn't long before Cream was one of the top attractions in the United States rock scene. And, but the problem was is they were missing some of the bigger engagements. Like an example would be they could have gone to Monterey Pop Festival, but their management had them booked at some other small places. So they were getting very good gigs, but the higher profile gigs like that, they, the management really had no clue about. So work continued on this album, which is this one here, Disraeli Gears. And this was working, they were working on this through the end of 1967. And the artwork was done by Clapton's roommate and friend Martin Sharp. So he did all the psychedelic drawings and stuff. Now this album also has a couple different versions. They recorded on the Atco subsidiary of Atlantic and they reprinted the name of the album at the top and they did some stuff on the back to make the titles more visible. So the American version of this album has a slightly different variation on the cover, just like the first album. We're Going Wrong is an interesting song in 6-8 time uh, with some very interesting drumming. And that was some of the different stuff that they were doing that other bands just couldn't really compete with. The other two songs I just played, World of Pain and Dance the Night Away, really reflected less of a blues sound and more of a West Coast sound. Now some of the songs they were doing were just 
just really quite psychedelic like these two. To the violence of the sun. But the rainbow has a beard. Now both of those songs are very good examples of the heavy rock direction the Cream is really pioneering. And Tales of Brave Ulysses is a great use of the wah-wah pedal, early use of that, that pedal. And Slobber, which stands for She Walks Like a Bearded Rainbow, is just a great example of some heavy rock guitar. So right for the BBC, Chris Jones described this album as a perfect encapsulation of the point where the blues got psychedelic and in turn got heavy. Now, believe it or not, Erdogan and Atlantic were not enamored with Jack Bruce's compositions at all. And thankfully, popularity had the vision and uh, the wherewithal to help craft those songs into absolute classics. In the sunshine of your life. So this song is a great example of how the rock genre was created. It's the, it was the future of rock, and that's heavy guitar and perhaps the definitive psychedelic rock song, and this became probably Cream's signature song. Now, Cream was fashionable more than just in the music sense, but also their clothing, and they had some of their clothes designed by the Dutch group The Fool, who also painted some of their guitars as well. And as their profile continued to rise, they were offered some soundtrack work, like in this Danish film. Do you remember So their next project was another soundtrack. This is The Savage Seven. And this featured Cream and Iron Butterfly. Cream got the title track here. And I, if you hear this song, it's a very unlikely Cream song. And this is a biker exploitation movie. And you would think they would come up with some kind of Born to be Wild type of song, but Cream comes up with this song called Anyone for Tennis. Anyone for tennis, wouldn't that be nice? The band appeared on the Smothers Brothers show to promote Anyone for Tennis, and they did a little skit where they're swatting with tennis rackets against the screen screen. It was really corny. And it's hard to believe that they did this song and released it as a single. Very unlike the Cream sound. It was a little bit more like Wrapping Paper Part 2. Cream's music was perfect for movie soundtracks, but when they did television appearances in the States anyway, there was an occasion for them to be asked to tone it down a little bit, which they did here on the Glenn Campbell Show. Ladies and gentlemen, the cream. Here they are. Wheels of Fire was the next album, and uh, this is a version I bought in the 80s, so this does not have the original silver foil cover, which is a very elaborate uh, cover and gatefold. Kind of a bad trip here. Martin Sharp was brought back to do the artwork for this, so the same guy who did the Disraeli Gears album cover. And Cream was focusing mostly on the United States at this point. They were doing most of the recording there. They were making the most money touring there. And for some reason, this album came out a full two months earlier in the, in the United States than in, in the UK. And the live shows that they were doing were some of the best shows around. They were playing everywhere, and they, they wanted to do a live album. And instead of doing a live album, they did this album, which is half studio, half live. White Room was one of their biggest hits, the second biggest hit, actually. Another uh, Pete Brown and Jack Bruce song. And it's more fully realized, more complex, I think, than Sunshine of Our Love. And it got to number six in the United States, number 28 in the UK. I wanna just show you what my politics are. I'm sitting on top of the world, born under a bad sign. These three songs typify this album, and Born Under a Bad Sign. We hear Clapton doing his Albert King guitar lick. Now Ginger Breaker comes up with three writing credits on this album, and the most impressive is called Those Were the Days, and that's co-written with Mike Taylor. Free, 
Probably his most notorious composition is the psychedelic Pressed Rat and Warthog. Pressed Rat and Warthog close down their shop. Passing the Time is one of their most bizarre songs and it shows how they took the psychedelic music movement and they made it a little more delicate but also biting. And Baker plays a glockenspiel and Jack Bruce plays a cello and a calliope in that song. Felix Popolari played a very big role in this album. He was responsible for choosing the live shows that they were going to record and he set all that up. Plus instrumentally he added quite a lot of different instruments that you wouldn't normally hear on a Cream record like viola, organ, trumpet, and tonette. Now on the live disc there are only four songs, two songs per side, and this is how things were getting in the late 60s where you would leave room and have these extended jams so people could solo, and that's basically what Cream was about at this time. People wanted the solos, and or Cream thought that that's what people wanted, and they give you all your money's worth on this live disc. Now, Train Time is an oldie that used to be done by a Grand Bond organization, and then there's also a 16-minute version of Baker's Toad. For my money, I don't care for Cream Live on disc too much. I think you probably had to be there. These long solos and things that became in vogue in rock music were all the rage. And I, I very few of them translated well to record. Wheels of Fire was released in a couple different versions. It was released in two separate albums, a studio version and a live version. So this is a, an example of the studio version. There's Calling Live at the Fillmore. And then there's, a, this is, I forget what country this one's from. This is the studio version. This is by a completely different artist. This artist is by Clint Day. In America, I've only seen the double album, so I'm not sure uh, why that is, but it seemed like Cream was having bigger hits in the States anyway, and it could probably sell the double album in the States more easily. But nonetheless, uh, by the time this album came out, the band was really having problems. And one of the problems was, you know, the Ginger Baker, Jack Bruce issue. One thing that happened as the technology moved forward and these rock concerts got bigger, they also got louder and they had more and more Marshall stacks and the sound really bothered Baker. He had a hard time competing with uh, Jack Bruce's bass amplification. So that was an issue. Things got so bad one time that apparently Bruce was playing Clapton and Baker just walked off and Bruce couldn't even hear that they stopped playing. That's how loud this had gotten. And it all gave, it, gave them long-term hearing loss, as a matter of fact. So, so that was a problem. And as things got, Eric Clapton typically was, I wouldn't call him the peacemaker, but the issues between Bruce and Baker, he typically stayed out of. He would just walk away and those guys had to kind of figure out their stuff. And there was always tension between them. And it was really reaching a boiling point here. And Clapton's idea was to possibly bring in another player. And he wanted to bring in Steve Winwood. Winwood was, I guess you'd say, on hiatus from his band Traffic. And by adding Winwood, you wouldn't have so much uh, pressure on the three soloists. And you'd have another guy that could do rhythm, he could sing, he could play. So that would have alleviated some of the tension, some of the, um, I guess, the long solos that were expected of audiences at this point. Now Clapton also went on to say that some of the later Cream shows, you know, the members of Cream are just showing off. So when you get to that point, you're not really playing for the audience and you're not really playing for one another. So I think that also was a problem. Now, despite all the problems between uh, Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce, the one that really, I think, pulled the plug on the, the band more than anybody was Eric Clapton. And it wasn't because of Baker and Bruce. It was because of a Rolling Stone article. And there was a, you know, once a band gets huge, you know, they want to knock you down. If you're underground, you're the darlings. Well, these guys were huge now. So Rolling Stone took some shots at Clapton. Part of the article reads, Cream has been called a jazz group. They are not. They are a blues band and a rock band. Clapton is a master of the blues cliches of all the post-World War II blues guitarists. 
So that article really got to Clapton, and supposedly he fainted when he read it. So <laughs> I don't know if there's a fainting couch nearby, but uh, it really affected him. And, you know, Ginger Baker said, you know, he just took it too personally. And Bruce, I think, felt the same way. But this things were ending at the time. Things were just getting to be too much for the band. The trio was a very difficult thing to continue to outdo one another. How do you keep outdoing yourself as a trio? And I think there was just so much space to fill that the members got tired of trying to fill it all the time. So they decided to break up, and at the end of 68, they would do a series of farewell concerts, culminating with one or two concerts in London. Now, in addition to doing a farewell concert, the band agreed to do one last album, and in between this time, they decided to re release a single, and they released Crossroads from the live portion of Wheels of Fire, which didn't chart in England. I don't even know if it was released, but it did really well in the States. When I'm going down to, Rosedale, take my right up on my side. to show you how they split up their live shows on this farewell well tour, they did 22 shows at 19 venues in the United States, and then two in London to end it. So let's look at the final album. This is aptly titled Goodbye. And it's probably considered their least essential album. There are only three new songs on here. Uh, well, three new songs, uh, studio tracks, one by each member, and a couple live songs. And it's really, the studio tracks are actually more produced, and it's a good indication of how they might have carried on if they didn't break up. When I was young, they gave me a moment. I always really like the song Doing That Scrapyard Thing by Jack Bruce, and he uses some wah-wah bass in that, al in that song. And one of my all-time favorite songs by Cream is Badge by Clapton, and that got to number 65 in the States and number 18 in the UK. And I think this song is a good representation of what could have been. You know, they added George Harrison on this track. He's playing rhythm guitar. And I think just adding another member may have added just more depth to their sound. I mean, you don't have to do Sunshine of Your Love over and over again. This is an example of a direction they could have gone. And surprisingly enough, the chart action of Cream got better once the band announced their breakup, you know, at least in the UK anyway. And things started to falter a little bit in the States. So this album was released in early 1969. They had already broken up and gave their farewell concert, and it still did very well. Now, late in 69, they did their first Best Of album, and it's Best Of Cream. I don't understand what the vegetables are on the front cover, but on uh, the eggplant and such, but uh, nice color photo on the back. Excellent compilation. This got to number three in the U.S. and number six in Great Britain. And if you're you vinyl collectors out there, if you're looking to start anywhere, this would be a, a wonderful place to start. So the first solo album to be recorded and released was Jack Bruce's Songs for Taylor. This is a pretty good album. A lot of friends joining him on this record. And then... Um, Clapton wanted to get together with Steve Winwood and form a group again. And these guys always had wanted to get together and do something on a bigger scale. And uh, Winwood really insisted on having Ginger Baker in the band. Baker, uh, he wanted to do a band as well. Uh, Clapton was a little bit reticent about getting together with Ginger Baker in another band. He would preferred Jim Capaldi, who was in traffic, and he was also available, but he agreed to do Ginger Baker. So Baker joined. The other guy that they got on bass was Rick Gretsch from Family, and the band Family was doing really well, and Gretsch quit in the middle of a tour, so that didn't go over well with members of Family. But when you get a chance to join Winwood and Clapton, you jump at it, right? So there was a ton of demand. Cream was stu still huge at this time. Had they not broke up, they would have continued to be selling out huge, um, huge venues. And managers Stigwood and Blackwell smelled money. And this is when things got being billed as super group, and they, they represented them, and they started to get tours ready for them and this band was not ready so this all happened very very quickly and they call themselves blind faith and some of the, some radio ads actually build them as the new cream the heavy drums of ginger baker plus the wailing guitar of eric clapton it's the concert spectacular of the year as the wfil boss jocks present the new cream 
And since they didn't have enough material to really, at least original material to play, they resorted to old Cream and Traffic songs, which the audience loved, but it disillusioned the band. So Blind Faith uh, had one album, that's this one here. We got uh, two covers. We got the British cover, which is The Girl, as you may well know, with certain parts covered up strategically so I don't get thrown off this platform. And the uh, United States cover, which is basically the back cover of this. Wasted and I can't find my way home. So Blind Faith, this was a popular album. It sold very well. People loved it. They did several live shows, but I think by October they were done. And Clapton was the one that ended it. He felt bad because Winwood was really more into it than he was. And uh, he felt um, that he let him down a bit. But Clapton was rather disillusioned at this time, and he stepped back and performed kind of as a backup player with Delaney and Bonnie and then the Plastic Ono Band. Uh, Ginger Baker had started uh, Ginger Baker's Air Force with Steve Winwood, Rick Gretsch, Denny Lane, and Graham Bond, among others. Clapton then released a solo record called Eric Clapton, which did pretty well. Rain is falling through the mist of sorrow that surrounded and after Clapton's album, uh, he ended up forming Derek and the Dominoes, which was probably the, the, the biggest hit of all these ex-Cream members. Just because Cream had broken up doesn't mean you can't keep releasing material by Cream, which is what they did in, at ATCO in, here in the States. And Live Cream was released in 1970. This album charted very well. This and along with the Volume 2, which came out in 1972, are still considered essential Cream recordings. The writer Donald Clark of Penguin Encyclopedia of Pop Music had said about Cream's appearance on the pop scene, he said this, he said, called it the heat death of pop music. And I can see what he meant. You know, all those mid-60s pop bands just couldn't compete with this kind of instrumental prowess. And this became the new way of rock. And um, arguably the most famous trio in rock history, Cream really delivered, uh, they over-delivered, and they left behind quite a legacy. So that is my history on Cream. If you like this video and want to support this channel more, I do have a Patreon subscription that you can check out, and any additional support is greatly appreciated. So I thank you for watching Pop Goes the 60s.